Hi and welcome or welcome back to my channel. I'm Simon and today I'm back with my December wrap up. So all of the books I have read in December and the one that I'm planning on finishing before the stroke of midnight for it is New Year's Eve. I cannot believe, I'm very excited though, that 2024 is less than 24 hours away. Oh, lots of 24s there. Anyway, let's get a crack in. I did my December book haul in my last video and wanted to do my wrap up before I then wrap up the year officially at some point next week with my favourite books of 2023. One of my favourite videos to make, one of my favourite videos to watch. I love all of this end of year, beginning of a new year content. Although I was chatting with Nathan of Nathan's Nook on Instagram the other day and we were both saying like December seems to get overshadowed which is why I wanted to make sure I did a haul and a wrap up for it. So without any further waffle because I'm not going to be editing this that much, I am going to crack on. Now with my first book it could kind of give a bit of a vibe or even a theme to December which could have been DNF December because I did DNF quite a few books and I am actually planning on being a bit more of a DNF machine next year but we'll talk about that when we do my plans for 2024 video at some point and um, I DNF'd sadly Chain Gang All Stars by Nana Kwame Ajay Brenya. I was really looking forward to this because it was described as a sapphic Hunger Games in a dystopic world that looks at how prisoners and the whole sort of prison ideology is treated in such an appalling way and that really thrilled me. I felt like, and this is going to sound really daft, I felt like I was reading a film rather than a novel. I didn't ever really get into the characters and it's incredibly brutal, which I didn't really mind. I'm not squeamish at things like that. However, I felt like it was all action and no, well, there wasn't much interaction actually between the characters and them trying to kill each other. And there is, I guess, something around found family, friendship, love in all its forms and I guess not colleagues exactly, but creating a team and how diverse a team can be and how sometimes you have to work with people you don't like. All of that was great, but it felt just like, it sounds odd because I'm quite a fan of plot, but this felt like too plotty to the point where I couldn't really keep up with the characters and all the action. And then sometimes somebody was only in it for a paragraph. So I was like, I started to not care so much. And I've realized that books where there's too many characters or too much going on, I just end up distancing from and feeling like I'm watching them in a kind of aloof way, which will link to another book that I DNF'd as well. I'm not saying this is a DNF forever, but it's definitely a DNF for now. And I, I think as well, I wasn't 100% surprised because when I read his short story collection, there was like a few that I really liked, but a lot of it was very fast paced about a point rather than the people within a specific point if that makes sense. So there we go. Sad that I didn't like it. I should say as well, um, there are quite a lot of footnotes in here and I don't love footnotes in a book. And I can't remember who I was talking to about it, who was saying that the footnotes added to it. I don't think they did. I think they really detracted from it in this book because they were more about setting the world in which the characters found themselves rather than any deep emotional level or really any, I guess there was the context of the world that was being created. But at the same time for me, they left me a bit cold. It was like facts for no real reason. Unlike the next book that I read that had footnotes, which again, I was like, oh no, this could be awful. But I thought this was honestly just incredible. And the footnotes were fascinating. And it's the kind of book that I describe as a Google book because you read it and you're learning this, but you go off and discover more. This is My Government Means to Kill Me by Rashid Newson. And this came out, I think, in hardback last year, but came out in paperback in America this year. I really want this to get published in the UK. If there's any publishers watching this, please publish this book, because honestly, it is phenomenal. This is a book all about a young man called Earl, who changes his name, actually, when he runs away from home to go and be in New York. He takes all of his savings. It's in the 1980s. He's a black man, uh, a queer black man. And that all becomes really poignant within the story because he's heading to a New York City that's on the sort of end edges of freedom and sort of the, the cusp of the beginning of the AIDS crisis. And through Earl's eyes, we get to see 
both the excitement, the exhilaration, the freedom within that city, but also the pain, the terror and the loss within that city. And Earl is such a fascinating character because he not exactly shapeshifts, but you're not 100% sure he's telling you, the reader, the truth. He's certainly not telling the people around him the truth quite often. But what I also loved about this was that I felt like I was there. The way Rashid Newsom creates this New York City of that time is there in all of its, like I said, wonder, but also all of its gritty, dark back alleys and well there's a lot of um, male bathhouses and things in here which I thought was brilliant and there's this wonderful sprinkling of salaciousness and this wonderful sense of humour as we follow this man going into all sorts of walks of life and, and it, in the wrong hands this wouldn't have worked because you do get to see all of society and a lot of really key historical moments and people of the time, but it all reads so real, you completely and utterly believe that you're there with him as he meets, you know, the Trump family at one point, there's some really interesting stuff around the housing crisis and how they were linked to that. Um, you're with him when he meets certain politicians in bathhouses or in other places. And it's thanks to this book that I ended up watching Rustin, the movie, because I had not heard of him at all. And he was, so incredible as you know part of a huge political movement not just for queer people but for black people and yeah i i thought this was amazing and the footnotes made me laugh they made me go and listen to music of the time they gave some really interesting insight into pop cultural icons who were either closeted um or who came out and then went back in the closet before they died it also just looked at the way that people with AIDS were treated and there's a real humanity within the writing here of people who were so ostracised. I just, I could go on about this book forever. I nearly made a video all about this, just this book, but then didn't get around to it. But I, I just loved it. Can you tell? I loved it. I really, really, really loved it. And it, like I said, has sent me off in directions of films, music, other books, poetry collections. It's fab. Then also, on a queer note, um, I reread Heartstopper Volume 4 before then reading Heartstopper Volume 5 by Alice Osman. And for those of you who, I don't know how you won't have heard of these possibly, but they're about Charlie and Nick, two boys who become fr unlikely friends and fall in love. One of them is gay, one of them is bisexual, and we follow them and their friends. And we've got to the point now where their relationship is taking on a more uh, mature turn within with certain activities. I don't want to spoil anything, but I really love this. I think as the series has gone on, Alice Eisman is dealing with some really complex things in a brilliant way in the fact that the way through the images inside the book, emotions are shown, like they're here for love, obviously, and the fact that they're getting a little bit frisky, let's be honest. Um, the, the way that she does that, I just think is brilliant because it's so subtle and seems deceptively simple with the imagery and yet it totally hits you in the feels but also you get it and I think that's really really incredible so I thought both of those were brilliant. I don't reread often but because it had been a while since volume four I wanted to uh, get back to uh, volume five. Now I mentioned DNF December and this next book is a book that I should have DNF'd but I was reading it for a book club that I did with Kate of Harrison Harris, Emily who works at Harrison Harris and my mother Louise of Louise Savage Muses. Um, so or the artist formerly known as my mother when we were in Suffolk to be booksellers for a weekend at Harrison Harris. We had so much fun and we're hopefully going to do it in 2024 again. So there we go. We've even offered to look after the bookshop if Kate wants a holiday. Um, moving on. So the book was Mistletoe Malice. This was my choice because I'd heard such brilliant things about it in terms of comparisons to the Cazalettes, which admittedly, I haven't read the Cazalette Chronicles. I would like to at some point, maybe that's something for 2024, who knows? But I know how much people love it. And so I was like, right, this is gonna be great. And it was sort of described as this really snarky family Christmas, which we've all heard our friends talk about or possibly even had ourselves with our families. But this book didn't, I mean, it did deliver snark, but to an odious point. Like I didn't care about any character. They were all awful. 
and I just sort of lost interest. And I actually think this book has been quite badly mismarketed. And I said that at the um, discussion that we had with a lovely lot of some of you were there, which was fab. Um, I, I think if this had been sort of packaged more as a Persephone kind of novel, I would have enjoyed it more because it's a really interesting look at the societal expectations, particularly on women at the time. However, it's so laced in this utter bile that they all have for each other. It just kind of ended up feeling very, I don't know, cyclical and a bit dull and nothing seemed to move forward. And then if it did, it went backward. I will say the housekeeper was my favorite character. Amazing asides, very witty, saved the book for me because I really, really struggled to get through it. I think it's got a cracking cover, which does link to the book. But again, I felt like this is almost being pitched like a thriller at Christmas, like a Christmas crime. I wish a crime had happened and somebody in this book had been murdered. There we go, I'll leave it like that. Um, then on to another incredible, incredible book that I really took my time with because it just, I don't know, it's one of those books that you don't, you want to read on, but you don't want it to end. And there's just so many amazing characters and it's going to be really hard to sum this book up because there is so much within it. It's the Heaven and Earth Grocery Store by James McBride, which I'd seen a few people rave about later on in the year on Instagram this year. And it intrigued me. And I thought, well, I want to give this a whirl because I'd heard it was a murder mystery that was set in the, oh, no, this is where I'm going to go horribly wrong, 1920s. Um, but it actually starts in the 1970s when a body has been discovered in an area called Chicken Hill in Pottstown. And is it Pottstown? I'm not second guessing, Pottstown, why am I second guessing myself? In Pennsylvania. And a body is discovered with a Jewish medallion on it. And a man who has the similar medallion is then questioned. However, there's a dreadful storm. Everything gets washed away. And then we head back from the 70s to the 1925s, 1925s. 1920s to find, that's where I tripped over myself there, we head back to the 1920s to find out what happened and what this book does. At first I was, I will admit, I was a bit like, oh, there's a lot of characters and there's a lot going on and there's a lot of sort of setting up these particular people and I don't know if I can quite keep up with what's going on, but it's setting up how it was in the 1920s for the Jewish communities in America along with the black communities within America and how they ended up in specific places together where you would also have like random things where the Ku Klux Klan would march through the street and you just hid in your house and dealt with it like it's just or almost like forgot about tried to forget about it that was all a lot to take in at the beginning but then slowly but surely you get to know certain characters and what I thought this book did magically and I think James McBride is a legend I'm definitely going to be reading lots more of him next year is you meet characters who then bring in another character, you head to those characters, they bring in someone else, and it kind of goes like that, but the, the characters you've read before don't go away, they're still very much there, and some characters will disappear and then come back a little bit later. There's one particular one that's almost a bit like a sort of magical demon in some way. Anyway, um, it's just brilliant done, and so the murder you sort of forget about, and then, yeah, it just, it's brought, and, and I don't want to say much more other than I loved every single character bar the Doctor, that's all I'll say. And I, well actually no, there's a few other characters as the book goes on that are pretty odious, but what James McBride does that I think is incredible is what I felt Toni Morrison did when I read The Bluest Eye back at the very beginning of this year, and it's brilliant how books speak to each other throughout a year, or through a year maybe, is that he puts you in the mindset of people with really odious opinions and beliefs and doesn't justify them, doesn't empathise with them, but tries to explain why they have become the people they have. And I think that's a really powerful thing in fiction. But at the same time, and I don't quite know how I can, because some of the themes in this book are really hard to deal with, there is a slight cosiness. I felt, I, th I don't know if it was like I felt I was in really safe hands with James McBride's writing, but yeah, I just thought this was spectacular. And if you haven't read it, get to it. I don't know when it's out in paperback, but some point soon. So um, yeah, I, I absolutely love that. And I want to actually specifically thanks, thank Brett for making me read that because we had a little chat about it. Um, 
Whilst I was reading all of those, I was also reading my short story advent calendar for 2023 from the lovely folk at Hingston and Olsen. I have read these over the last however many years and I really enjoy them. Some years have been stronger than others. Some years I want to, after having read a short story, go and read or buy everything by an author. Some years less so. This was a year where it was less so. I actually even DNF'd, I think, one short story in here, which is mad because it was a short story, but it was just doing my nut in. It's hard to surmise this collection because there's 25 stories and we ain't got time for that. It's new year later. Come on, we've all got parties to go to, even if they're just a party for one in your own bedroom, which have been some of my favourite <laughs> New Year's. I've got my mother this year and my stepdad, so that'd be nice. Anyway, um, so yeah, I, I enjoyed it. There was one short story that came right to the fore from my childhood, which is one that my uncle Derek, great uncle Derek, memorised when we, well, he would memorise short stories on walking holidays that we would go on. We used to do like these two week jobs where we were walking like 11 hours a day and he would try and well he wouldn't try he would memorize two stories per walk and tell me them they'd be like Arthur Conan Doyle like the Victorian greats and one was in here and it gave me the absolute chills but also made me feel really emotional because it made me really really think of him and um, in terms of new to me authors Leopoldine Core. I have bought her short story collection I think I showed it in my December book haul which I'll link down below and then Authors that I haven't read for a while, Beryl Bainbridge, I'm desperate to read everything she has written because her short story set at a pantomime, the day I was going to see Panto spookily enough, was so good and so dark and twisted. It was everything Mistletoe Malice should have been, except done in the most condensed, brilliant, brutal way. I absolutely loved it. So yeah, this was a mixed bag for me, but I'll still definitely do it next year. So we have that. Uh, then on to a, well, the first of three Christmas books that I headed to and I read Last Night at the Lobster by Stuart O'Nan on Christmas Day on and off between basically eating <laughs> various different things all day what what's not to look that's just made my stomach growl actually because I'm thinking about nibbles moving on uh, and I said nibbles this is set in the lead up to Christmas. It's about a restaurant called The Red Lobster, which is closing. And we meet the man who is the manager of the restaurant. We meet the rest of the team. We find out the different relationships that interlink between them, different frustrations, different uh, lusts, all sorts. And the reason that I picked this up is actually because it had been recommended to mum by viewers on her channel as Stuart O'Nan being kind of the voice of the working class in America and that appealed to her that she was then talking about that a lot and that really appealed to me I think I ended up getting it before she has I don't know even if she's got it maybe I'll let her lend her this depends how she behaves over the next 48 hours anyway um I I thought this was good I didn't I liked it a lot I didn't love it like I didn't feel like I got to know and this is something that I'm clearly learning about myself I didn't feel like I got to know enough about the characters again there's a lot of characters here I loved some of the set pieces there's a brilliant uh, scene where a child has far too much ice cream and you can imagine what happens there there's a brilliant scene where an old couple come and they don't really want anything on the menu there's different uh, feisty moments between the waitresses so I enjoyed all of that I enjoyed it I didn't love it I'm not sure I'd rush to read anything else by Stuart and Anne, but I'm glad I've read it at the same time. So that's my thoughts on that one. I felt a bit let down by the ending as well. I kind of wanted something to happen that was hinted at, but never did. If you've read it, you might know what I mean. Then on to my next DNF, and that was, and I was so excited about this book. I thought this was going to be the perfect Christmas treat. It's Murder on the Christmas Express by Alexandra Benedict. This is just really, for me, badly written. When I started reading it, I thought, well, this could be interesting because she's hidden Kate Bush songs within the text. That sounds like fun and a good, I was going to say Easter egg hunt, but probably more like a mince pie hunt considering it's a Christmas book. I thought the fact that she'd put like, um, not anonyms, what am I talking, acronyms? What's it when you, anagrams, anagrams. She put anagrams in the book as well if you wanted to find them. I decided I didn't because I thought that would break me away from it. However, I love a book set on a train. I've always wanted to go on a sleeper train. It's been like one of my dreams. I've never done it. I'm bad now, that's not true. I have done it in, me and my mum went to Kenya and we did one there and that was amazing. I remember reading Nancy Drew the entire time I was either not looking out the window or asleep. Anyway, um, 
this was very modern. It had a recently retired detective who was a bisexual and you were told this at any given opportunity because you needed to know that she was a bisexual and this was a woke book, um, which I, know, I don't know what I've got about. I think sometimes I feel like when queerness is used as a marketing tool or I guess becomes the biggest attribute of a character, I'm a bit like, yeah, but there's so much more to people than that. And yes, it's great mention that she's bisexual at the beginning, but you don't need to mention it almost every chapter. It just, that didn't work for me. Um, there was a really odd scenario with an influencer with it. And again, the odious character thing came to the fore a bit. And I think, I don't think I know, I love a dislikable character if I feel I get to know them and see their complexities and their flaws. Like I was saying about the odious characters in the um, Heaven and Earth grocery store, like you get them fully formed and you can see glimmers of like hope within people. This felt very much a bit oddly going back to Chang and all sorts this felt like I was reading a potential TV series you know Sunday nights over Christmas and I would watch it I'm not gonna lie I think this would probably be better as a TV show but for me it was the constant analogies and I even sent screenshots to my friend Tess because I was like this is bad the amount of times things are compared to snow was ridiculous then it would be things like there was one line about the Christmas um, looking at back at London the lights looked like fairy lights like lights and lights there was a few moments where that happened there was one where there was an allergy to the warmth of someone's voice being like the warmth in a birthing pool and I was just like for goodness sake whoop. so yeah I just got really frustrated by it no offense to Alexandra Benedict but that's just how it was if you've read it and you've loved it good for you I was just really disappointed by it and I couldn't let it go it just yeah it bothered me so what I had to do next was a book that I'd seen Jen recently haul on her channel but had already got on my shelves and that is A Good Year by Polly's Loizu and this is set in the oh, 1925 again that's a little bit spooky um I hadn't spotted that this is set in 1925 in Cyprus and we meet Despo who is pregnant and is due to have a baby quite soon. It is the 12 days of Christmas that this book is set throughout, so the 12 days after Christmas, and it's a time where, and I want to say this right, Kalin Kantzari come up from hell to wreak havoc, and Despo becomes very worried about what these monsters might do to her unborn child, and just feels like there's bad luck around. At the same time, we meet her husband, who's kind of struggling with marriage and becoming a father but also becomes quite beguiled by an Englishman who comes to Cyprus and we follow on from there and I shall say no more in terms of plot. I thought this was really well written. I sped through it. I, I didn't, I, I think I inhaled it in like two sittings. Um, I loved the folklore and myth in there. I loved the way it looked at sexuality and desire. I loved all the food in it. Can I mention food anymore? I probably can. And yeah, I just thought this was a really fun, quite thought provoking in parts book. I think the ending for me let it down for me a little, well, yeah, it let it down for me a bit because it was very ambiguous. Now, I don't mind an ambiguous ending. I have to say, I don't like them as much in short stories because I feel like you've not got to know enough of the world. Although if the short story writer has done it well enough to do. But anyway, this I felt like was a bit too ambiguous. And whilst I, I can take the characters off further in my head, I feel like I wanted a tiny bit more signposting at the end. But other than that, really, really enjoyed it. And it was a very different take on a festive tale and I would recommend you get your mitts on this for next Christmas. Then on to another DNF. I think is it the last DNF? Yes it is, it's the last DNF. Um, and this is a book I've DNF'd a couple of times and I... it feels very unfair as a member of the queer community to say that I find the amount of queer people in a book ever excessive because so many queer voices have been lost in the past and this is a book that is historical and is a book that I've seen many many people read about in fact I've had this book recommended to me probably more than any other book this year um I just I can't work out whether because it's so many people's favorite book so many people's favorite book 
that I am fighting my unsure nature. I'm fighting my uncertainty because I want to love it as much as everyone else, but I also think the pressure of everyone loving it so much is probably doing it a bit of a disservice with me or has done a bit of a disservice with me. So again, this is not a DNF forever, but it's definitely a DNF for a while. It's In Memoriam by Alice Wynn. And I've had some very heated, pointed comments when I've talked about this book and said that I'm not sure about it in terms of the fact that not every character in here is gay. I did think I did think, I did a video earlier in the show, I was like, I read this book and I was like, is everybody gay? Which is that wonderful scene from in and out I think it is, which everyone seems to be doing ins and outs on um, Instagram at the moment. Anyway, in, back to In Memoriam, not Out Memoriam. So it, I want to love this book because I think what it's doing in terms of shining a light in a very dark period of history on queer men, which isn't seen that often, I think that's really admirable. For me, the amount of queer people, firstly at the boarding school that this book starts, where we meet two young men who have this love for each other that they don't speak about, they don't communicate it, they almost do, there's this tension between them. But it seems like 80% of everyone there is queer. That's fine. I don't think it's realistic and I don't think the acceptability within this book is realistic and that to me just kept breaking sort of this spell. I will say as well, again, me and characters, I didn't feel like I got to know the two characters well enough to define them. So it was very much about what they were saying or doing rather than necessarily, well no, I suppose that was what they were thinking and feeling, but I just wanted more of a I wanted more insight into them to differentiate the two because they felt very samey. And then because there's so many characters in this book and you don't really get to know them that well, that when it heads to war and when it heads to characters being killed or injured, there are lists in this book of that. And I just was like, I don't feel anything. And I'd heard so many people saying how emotional they felt about this book. And I was like, I'm not getting it. And then that made me start to feel a bit like, oh gosh, is there something wrong with me? Am I just really, really callous? Um, so yeah, I feel like what I would like to do with this book is head to it in like six months when I've got this and nothing to distract me from it and I can just give it a really good crack. It might be that it's just not for me. Not every book is for everyone, but because so many blinking bloody lot of you love it so much, I'm just feeling like I'm not at the, well, it's hard to describe this book as a party, but you know what I mean? I feel like I can see everyone in a room through sort of hazy glass, having a great time talking about how much they love this book and I'm in the room next door, which is a bit cold and the lights aren't even on. So yeah, that's how <laughs> this book. Wow, that was a slightly depressing way to go. Thankfully, the next book that I read is another absolute corker and I insist, in fact, I demand that you all read this book when it comes out. I think it's next week in America and the UK, I don't know where about everywhere else. It's The Storm We Made by Vanessa Chan and oh my goodness, I just love this book. I had got a very advanced proof of it and I'd seen that Tracy Chevalier had uh, given it a quote and actually it's on the front, A Storytelling Star is Born. I think there's another one on the back as well. Was that? Yes, Brave and Immensely Moving, The Storm We Made is one of the most powerful and confident, excuse me, debuts I've ever read. Completely and utterly true. Now I know Tracy doesn't give many quotes to many books and so I was like right that's really piqued my interest because this must be a corker and oh my goodness it is. What's it about? This is set again in the 1920s and it's set in, I want to get this right, oh no sorry it's the 1930s I fibbed. Um, so well we first meet Cecily in the 1940s and there are young boys that have been going missing in the uh, town that she lives in, in Malaysia. And as eventually one of her own children, Abel, goes missing. And she believes it is the world sort of having its revenge on something she did in the 1930s when the Japanese occupied Malaysia. And so we follow both those timelines because we go back to what she did and then we go forward through her eyes but also the eyes of her three children to what follows on from Abel's disappearance and 
as things develop at that time. And I just thought it was so well done. There's some really difficult scenes in this book, but I think Vanessa Chan handles them beautifully. There's a slight, there's so much warmth and heart in this book, yet also when awful things happen, there's a slight, and I don't want to say clinical, but there's this like distance, I guess, which is, I think, purposeful to readers so that even though you, you know something awful is happening, you don't get too much detail, you get enough, and sometimes it verges on uncomfortable, well, it verges on, it is uncomfortable, but I think the way that she, I, ju I just think how she's crafted this is phenomenal. I mean, I don't know much about that period in history and that part of the world. I love that book for teaching me more and making me want to, like I was saying about um, my government means skill me, want to go off and Google more and find out more. It's given me a really different insight into that period of history. And I thought the way that, again, what I loved about James McBride, I thought the way that she writes about some really difficult characters um, with some very complex uh, views, actions, behaviours, and doesn't forgive them, doesn't, but also doesn't really judge them, which I think is a very, very deft thing to do. But the way she sort of tries to work out why people behave the way they behave is, yeah, this is another phenomenal book. Then we have, oh, and I should say, I read this for December's Savage Prompt, which was a book with Weather in the title. Mum and I will be recording the picking of the prompts. They're all in here very, very soon. Lots of you have been asking if we're doing it again for 2024. We are, and I am thrilled that lots of you are really, really keen to take part because, yeah, it's been a lot of fun this year. Anyway, so that's that one. Speaking of prompts, the bonus prompt, the 13th prompt, and lucky for some, but lucky for me, um, because I enjoyed it very much, uh, was a book with a mother and son relationship and I read Mother Nature by Jediah Jenkins and this is a memoir about a walk that he reenacts quite often in the car. Um, well, it's more of a road trip version of a walk that his parents did and or was it just his mother? But his parents were both famous walkers and he has had a difficult relationship with his mother because he is gay, she, her religion and beliefs go against that or believe that being gay is against that. And so it's how they go on this sort of adventure together, which also is reigniting her memories and taking her back through what she did on that walk and getting them to know each other better. I enjoyed this a lot. I think I wanted it to be longer. I would have liked more insight into both of their, I guess, viewpoints with each other. I mean, you get them fairly, I mean, it's a very good book. This is me being a bit picky, just because I think, because I enjoyed it so much, I wanted more of it. And I felt like there was possibly a little bit more. It reminded me a bit of how I responded to Tara Westover's Educated, where I thought it was great, but I felt like I was still being held back a little bit and I wasn't getting like the full, story or the full picture and I wanted that extra maybe layer or level of understanding a little bit not necessarily them understanding each other but understanding their I know what I mean anyway very good uh, and we'll definitely head to more of um Jediah's books so yeah we have that and then last but not least I'm not going to talk about this book much which is probably good because we're on 33 minutes um I am going to finish this today it is the cutting season it will be my last read of 2023 it's by Attica Clock, an author who's sort of I was going to say thrillers they are literary thrillers generally with like a murder at their heart so they're also kind of true crime novels too but they also really look at big things so in the cutting season, a body of a woman is discovered on a former plantation that is now a museum. And as the book goes on, more about the past of that place come to the fore, as well as Karen, who is living on site with her daughter working there. And how much danger might they be in? What's really going on? I mean, it's real it's got a real gothic nature to it, which I like, but also it's really looking at this whole, I guess, is dichotomy the right word? That might not be the right word, between um, places of terrible history being places where you find out about that terrible history and how the balance is with that, but also 
what it might spark within people as well in all sorts of ways. So yeah, I'm not saying any more on my thoughts on it because this is the book that we are reading for my Patreon book club. I'll be talking about it on Wednesday the 3rd. And so yeah, our next book after that, I should just say, if you want to join my Patreon book club, it happens on the first Wednesday of every month, generally as a rule. And we will be reading The Flea Palace by Elif Shafak for February's book club on the 7th. Um, anyway, uh, so yeah, so I'll talk about this more probably in my January wrap up. So there we go. That is the last video from me in 2023 here on the channel. There might be another one on Patreon. We'll see. Uh, it depends on my editing. But I just want to thank you all for watching. Thanks for all the chats that we've had. Do feel free to keep the chat going in the comments down below. I'm always um, a fan of that and having a natter with you all. And yeah, I hope you all have a fabulous New Year's Eve. I hope you have an amazing New Year. I'm very excited about 2024. I love the number 24. I love the number 42. I'm 42 and 24 on the 24th. That all seems like it could be a good sign. I mean, let's face it, I could have jinxed it now. But anyway, thank you all for watching. I hope you have a fabulous New Year's Eve. Here's to 2024. I hope it brings lots of wonderful reads to you. Thank you for all the bookish chat and all the bookish shenanigans in 2023. It has been a joy and I will see you in another video in a new year. Bye.